Fearless Families. This is Dr. Cheryl Schmidt, and welcome to the Fearless Family Health Podcast. In a world that is filled with fear, my hope is to bring you inspiration, information, and support to live more joyfully and more healthy. Come with us as we interview parents, doctors, and experts in all areas of health and vitality. Let's make you the master of your family's future. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the podcast today. Today, we're going to talk about homeopathy. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of it, um, what exactly it is, and some case studies that um, Carrie, who my guest is, is going to talk about that she has experienced. So today, we have with us Carrie McCaslin. She is a professionally trained classic homeopath. She began her practice in 2012 and is located in Oak Harbor, Washington. Carrie completed six years of formal professional and clinical training in homeopathy with nationally known homeopath, Dr. Diederich Finn. I hope I said that right. She completed her required academic studies in anatomy, physiology, and pathology with internationally known homeopath and physician, Dr. Will Taylor. Carrie has successfully helped families and individuals from infants to the elderly overcome illness, injury, developmental issues, and chronic and acute conditions through the use of homeopathy. Homeopathy uses natural, non-toxic medicines that support the immune system and stimulate the body's natural ability to heal itself. Carrie's availability to clients in depth case analysis and vast homeopathic knowledge make her an invaluable health and wellness resource. Her greatest passion is to help her clients through a natural, non-toxic approach to their health concerns. She is a member of the Whidbey Island Holistic Health Association. She is a member with the Washington State Homeopathy Association and a member of Island Birth Association and a graduate of Western Washington University. Carrie sees her clients in the North Island Chiropractic and Wellness Center by appointment. To learn more about homeopathy, would be homeopathy, homeopathic, and to contact Carrie, please visit her at wouldbehomeopathic.com. Without further ado, let's talk about homeopathy with Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Welcome to the podcast. I am so excited to have you here and to share all your information that you have on homeopathy and just what it is, um, the history of it, and you know the fears people maybe have surrounding it if they don't know what's going on. So. Welcome to the podcast, Carrie. If you wanted to say hi, that'd be great. Great. Hi, Cheryl. I'm really excited and happy to be here. Perfect. So we're going to talk about homeopathy. So you are a classically trained homeopath. You say homeopathist? Homeop- I'm not sure how to say that. Actually, actually, you could say it that way, but um, homeopath. homeopath. So I'm a classically of course. trained homeopathist. <laughs> no, I'm like, I know homeopathy. I know the word for it. It's coming to me right now. Homeopathist? <laughs> like, no, so a homeopath. Right. <laughs> it's been a long time. Yeah, long so, time, yeah. Right? <laughs> so, got it. What, I know. Um, what's it, what is homeopathy? Um, well, homeopathy um, is a, a system of. Um, medicine that offers a different perspective than most people are used to. And I think um, we all grew up with um, one particular model, especially if we grew up in the United States, and that is allopathic medicine, which would be um, traditional uh, Western medicine as as everybody, you know, went to the doctor as a kid and did this and did that. But um, that was kind of it, at least when I was growing up. Um, so it offers a, a different perspective and a different set of tools when you're dealing with um, infectious or in contagious disease or chronic disease and illness or even um, acute illnesses. And it also addresses um, not just the physical, but the social and emotional health of a person. Yeah, that, so you know, it, really that a lot in allopathic medicine. I think they're starting to um, to kind of acknowledge that a little bit more in allopathic medicine, but definitely it's been something that traditionally homeopathy has 
has addressed. Right, uh, from the very beginning. So um, when you're working with a homeopath, we are looking at what we call the whole person and not just a particular symptom. And um, we're looking at um, what we call the vital force, which is part of um, the intelligence of each individual that animates us. Uh, we're, we're not just chemical and mechanical reactions. We have that innate intelligence. And so that, that, that takes into consideration um, everything that's going on with a person on that mental and emotional level as well as the physical level. So as a homeopath, um, my training entails looking at disease starting often on an emotional or a mental level. That's not always the case, but a lot of times it is. And so what happens over time is um, people start to manifest physical symptoms. And that is usually after they've been um, dealing with something chronic for a long time. And I use grief as just a really quick touchstone. So someone who has been in a state of grief for a long period of time and not moving through it in a healing process, they will eventually, in the homeopathic perspective, start to show physical symptoms of that grief. And so when they come to a homeopath, they usually come to me with a physical complaint. And then I start to uh, really dig in and find out what's going on with them. And I pull in the mental and emotional aspects of what's happening to them and take in those physical uh, symptoms as well. And that's how we start to create a homeopathic case for treatment. Yeah. And it's, it's so important. And I think I've talked about this on a couple other podcasts is how important that psychological, emotional aspect is to our overall health. And it is so downplayed. I mean, we use it as chiropractors and the chiropractic, we thought of, we talk about the three T's causing disruption, misalignment, subluxation in people. And that's the thoughts, traumas, and toxins. So we also bring in toxins and that's environmental toxins. Yes. Um, so those things are, you know, you take into account all of those creating what you are expressing as health or ill health and having to go back and, you know, addressing those three T's as well as what it's manifesting. So that, I mean, it's right in alignment with yes. a lot of the chiropractic philosophy. Yeah, it is because um, we, we look at that in homeopathy too, um, you're, uh, you know, working um, with manipulating the body to bring it back into balance through the skeletal and nervous system and muscular system. And um, we kind of work, um, I'm not manipulating anybody, but I'm looking at the history of a person. And um, so if, they're, if they've been someone who has been on a lot of medication, um, I'll take that into consideration that now I have a mental and emotional as well as physical, but I also have a toxin piece. So I'm, I'm looking at, um, like when I do that history, that becomes part of that whole person picture. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting to me how parallel the, um, the philosophies are in classic homeopathy yeah. and in chiropractic care, because chiropractic care actually came from more of a, holistic Eastern medicine kind of background. And, you know, as chiropractors, we adjust the spine to influence the brain function and the neurological function of a human being to allow information yes. to flow and communicate properly. So as a homeopath, what right. tools are you using to help to create a better I don't know, balance or function of the innate system of the body? So the, the tools that I use um, are homeopathic remedies. So I'm using medicines and they're referred to in homeopathy as a remedy. Um, and they come from uh, natural sources. So we take our remedies from um, the plant kingdoms, the fungus kingdoms, um, the, uh, it sounds a little weird, but uh, the bacterial and the viral kingdoms, um, animals, uh, minerals, and some of our remedies come from the periodic table. 
Now, when people hear that, they get a little nervous, and this is where some of that fear comes in about homeopathy. And they're thinking, well, that sounds really weird because you're using stuff that could be, you know, pretty toxic. But the way the homeopathic remedies are prepared renders them non-toxic when they are used. So Mm -hmm. I'm taking a, a, a raw material that has some medical properties that we know of, and it's being prepared in a homeopathic way um, to render it non-toxic. So it becomes actually, um, it becomes so fine particle-wise that it's almost like nano particles. And we've re- always referred to homeopathy as an energetic medicine. Um, people haven't always understood that. And that's where some of the, um, I guess the idea of it doesn't really work has come in is because you can't really see it. But with the technology that we have now, uh, we've been able to, with nano microscopes, actually find homeopathic remedies in cells, where when it first began over 200 years ago, it was developed by um, a German doctor and he was also a chemist, and he was the one that came up with this process of how to prepare raw material into an actual healing medicine. So it's um, my my tools are my remedies, and so I I'm not um, doing any kind of manipulating or anything um, other than doing uh, an intake and then a case study and matching that person's presentation of their symptoms with a homeopathic remedy in my repertoire, which there are hundreds of, thousands actually. Um, And how that happens is I um, kind of, you know, again, looking at them as a whole person, um, I'm treating like with like, and that is a mainstay principle in homeopathy, especially especially classic. Um, So if a person presents a good example, if somebody has a cold and they have a really runny nose that just burns like crazy and it leaves them raw and red around the outside of the nostril, then a, a remedy that I might look at Um, would be one called allium sepa, which is the Latin name for onion. Mm -hmm. And if you cut an onion, everybody knows you tear up, but you get a really runny nose and it can burn. So if I take that remedy of allium sepa and use it for that person with that really raw, runny, burny nose, I'm treating like with like. And once they start taking that remedy, then their symptoms start to subside and the healing response starts to take place and they start to get better. So it, it sounds like to me, it, um, it enhances their body's natural healing cycle. You know, you're not trying to really, you're not trying to downplay the symptom. You're not trying to like squash the symptom. A lot of allopathic medicine does, right? If you exactly they want to get rid of the symptom just to get rid of the symptom but in homeopathy right something to help to kind of booster it or enhance it to allow the body to heal quickly or more efficiently yes that is that's the principle in homeopathy we are working with the body and the intelligence of the body and the immune system there is no suppression there is um support of that body and a stimulus to cause and start the healing reaction. Well, I know homeopathy is always so intriguing to me because it's, it's hard for people to understand because we live in an allopathic model where you have a symptom and you just want to get rid of your symptom. And some people actually see homeopathy or any other natural remedy that people might be using 
as also just trying to suppress symptoms, but we really don't want to do that. Even as chiropractors, we don't want to suppress people's symptoms. We right. want to enhance their body's ability to function. So right. it, it's definitely um, hard yeah, for people because, to... Right. And we, we don't want suppression in uh, healing because um, when we suppress, we can create a deeper pathology within the body and then we start having more problems. Yes. And that's where even suppression of emotions, right? Yes, exactly. Because when you're suppressing emotions, eventually it's that mind body connection. You will eventually start to exhibit some sort of physical manifestation of that. And again, it becomes very individual. Somebody will, um, might, start to really have, um, let's say, uh, physical anxiety symptoms, or somebody might start to um, develop hives. Yeah, Yeah, we talk a lot about rashes, because rashes is a lot of times people try to suppress rashes. And a rash is a body is trying to like get things out of its system a lot of times just trying to like emit it out from deeper inside so if you suppress a rash just like an emotion you're pushing it deeper into the body and into your system which can then cause yeah i think in more issues um and a less level of health and more severe disease so exactly yeah, so when, how did how did homeopathy start i know you mentioned that it started like 200 years ago by a german um, scientist, <laughs> right? Chemist, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so how did he come about um, this in this in the beginning? Well, it's an interesting story. His name was Dr. Samuel Hahnemann, and he was a German phys- physician in the 1800s. And um, from our historical accounts of him, he was a very well-educated man. His um, uh, medical training was done in Vienna which at the time was, you know, that's where the top people went in Europe. Um, He spoke seven languages. And what he found in his practice at during, you know, his day, uh, we have to remember this was before uh, the even people even identified or even knew about germs. They didn't really know about bacteria. They didn't know about viruses. So, their method of treatment um, was things like bloodletting and using um, what they call mercurial tonics, which would be based in mercury, and things like um, you know leeches and and there wasn't there wasn't um, a lot of understanding about uh, physical anatomy yet and the interaction and relation between um, each system within the body. So he got really frustrated with the fact that he wasn't getting people well. So he stepped away from medicine and he went into um, scientific um, research and started um, because he, because of his background in languages, he started um, interpreting other scientists of that time and their research. And he ran across this one particular um, research paper that talked about how in South America there was a particular uh, bark that was used by the people of that area to treat um, malaria. They didn't call it malaria back then, but that's that's what we know it as today. So he thought that was really interesting. So he started he started um, testing things on himself. He actually got some of that bark and made a tea with it and started drinking it and realized that it started producing symptoms in him like it treated. So he came up with the theory, the idea of if this can make me sick, if this can treat illness, and it can also make you sick with the same symptoms, it should be able to treat it. So he started this whole, he had a background in chemistry, which was helpful as well. So he started um, 
this whole experimentation on himself, and it developed into what we know today as classical homeopathy. He proved over 200 remedies, so he used 200 different substances um, and wrote down all of his physical, clinical findings, as well as how it was expressed on a mental and emotional level. And that was the beginning and the basis of um, what's called our Materia Medica in homeopathy. I know there's so much history to all these and, things and like a lot of things have been around for I so know. much longer than so much you know medicine that we currently use. I and, know. And then people are skeptical of all the natural things that have been around for hundreds of years and they'll jump on I taking know. a medication that's been out for two years. You know, so <laughs> it's just, I know. It's just kind of funny to me that that's how the world tends to work sometimes. Um, so now what, in so your practice, that, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to mention the thing that really blows me away when I look at this and when I started studying it professionally, because I've used homeopathy for myself for over 25 years, is that back in that time period, he and other physicians that started learning from him, his method, they started treating and curing syphilis, gonorrhea, tuberculina, uh, tuberculosis. I'm, I'm using, I use that uh, homeopathic word, tuberculinum, uh, tuberculosis. They were, they were curing these, in, these diseases that have been around for, you know, thousands yeah. of years based on the homeopathic principle. And he even has records of treating some people with the plague. And I know that sounds crazy because everybody goes, you can't, you know, you can't treat the plague or, oh, well, they can now we've got some antibiotics and things, but yeah. this was before again, germ theory, uh, the known properties of antibiotics and all that other stuff. Yeah. It's amazing. I think, I mean, you're preaching to the choir here because I'm, I'm always amazed by the yeah. amount of that the body can heal and um, how natural remedies can definitely help with a lot of things that are, are seem mind boggling to most people. Like they like, yeah, right. Yes. Sure, I did that. Like it just, there's, but, but yeah, I mean, it does happen. These things do happen, but now, I mean, you're not treating Ebola or <laughs> the plague in your clinic. <laughs> So what do people commonly no. come to you for? <laughs> no, we're not. Um, what do people commonly um, come to you for, for help with? Uh, gosh, that's such a broad scope. I, people come to me for all sorts of things, but it's interesting because, and I'll, and I'll get into more what they come to me for, but they usually come to me as a last resort. And that's not um, because that it, part of it is because they don't really know about homeopathy. And the other part is they've tried everything else within the allopathic arena. And I, I believe in all sorts of different types of method, medicines and treatments, but um, allopathic does not cover 100% everything. And so my philosophy is we need other things as well when we're dealing with things that are not resolving in our health. So they come to me for um, mostly chronic conditions, but I also work with acute conditions. So acute would mean um, the flu, colds, seasonal allergies, although to me that's a chronic issue because if it's re reoccurring, then every year, then it's chronic. Yeah. Um, things like um, food poisoning, um, some sports injuries. Um, there's some remedies that we use for um, the softer tissues, um, for muscle, for fascia, um, some for bone to help strengthen and repair bone a little faster. Um, so you get uh, musculoskeletal support from some of the homeopathic remedies. Um, you can use it for uh, things like um, acutely for babies who are going through difficulty teething, moms who uh, during pregnancy are having difficulty with constipation or, um, you know, other things that happen to our bodies during pregnancy that make us uncomfortable. Um, so those would be acute things. Chronic things would be more like um, 
gosh, um, I've had people that come to me for um, eczema, uh, psoriasis, uh, vitiligo, um, digestive issues, constipation, um, you know, chronic constipation, um, if uh, difficulty with um, uh, female hormones, menstrual periods, menopause, um, difficulty with uh, working in um, for kids like working in the classroom, difficulty with concentration, uh, ADH type uh, hyperactivity, and um, I work with a lot of kids on the autism spectrum. I mean, yeah, so it's I've had all range. sorts of stuff. It's such so, a broad I mean, range. Vascul- it's a huge broad range. Um, you know, vascular issues in older people, um, cognitive issues in older people. Uh, you know, just, I don't know, my list is long. Yeah. So what is the difference? Arthritis. <laughs> Some people can just, I mean, you can go to your local health food store and you can read the description of the symptoms that you're having. You can pick your, you know, bottle off the shelf and then just go and try that. So what's the difference between going to someone who, like yourself, who obviously is very well trained and knows your stuff in homeopathy versus just getting something out of the health food store? Do what, what do you encourage people to do? Well, um, so as a classical homeopath, um, when I look at things on the shelves in a store, especially if they're um, what I call a mixed remedy. Um, There's lots of different remedies in there at very low potency. And all those remedies may be a remedy that could be used for, let's say, constipation. But what they're hoping for is that one of them out of 10 will be the right one and will help your constipation. If you come to a classical homeopath, I'm going to find the one that is the one you truly need to truly create a curative healing effect for your situation. So I really zero in on, um, again, how a person is presenting on a mental and emotional as well as physical level. And some of our remedies can be very broad and can be used for lots of different things. But one thing we're trained for as a professional is looking for the unusual. So I could have five people um, that could come to me for constipation. And what I would do would be looking for the unusual presentation of symptoms in each one of them. Everybody who has constipation, you know, they're not moving their bowels. So that's like a, that's like normal to me. If you're constipated, you're not moving anything. So I'm looking for the unusual or the abnormal in each person. You're not going to get that when you go to the store and just pick a tube that says, um, oh, constipation. Because there's many, many remedies that can be used for constipation, but they all have a different remedy picture. Yeah, and I think that's why I think people have tried sometimes just using the bottles off the shelves and not gotten results that, you know, the bottle says you're going to get. And then they just say, well, it just doesn't work, right? Because they're not really tuning into exactly. what is the cause of their problems. So if you out there have been one of those people who have done that and have not gotten the results you want, you may really need to have someone who looks at see what remedy you actually need what you know because everybody's a little bit different like you said um but yeah exactly so we're all going to present in a different way yeah so did you want so um, share share some case case history or case studies or things like that of um people who've gotten sure so before i get to that though i'm going to go if i'm going to explain that a little bit better if i can um so in a particular remedy um, called pulsatilla, I'm always looking for certain things that are characteristic of that remedy, which would be just to give people an idea. So we look for key symptoms. 
when we um, are choosing a remedy for someone to use. And a pulsatilla person is going to always have a thick bland, a, a yellow-green type of discharge. It doesn't necessarily always have to come from the nose. Sometimes it comes from the eyes. Um, there's going to be um, changeability in their emotions. They're going to be often someone who is very weepy and um, needs a lot of company and reassurance around them. Uh, they're going to feel worse in a warm, stuffy room. They're going to feel worse when they eat rich foods like um, ice cream or, um, you know, some, something really rich, uh, cheesecake. Um, they're going to feel better when they're out in the open air. So that is when I talk about a remedy pitcher, those are specific things to the remedy pulsatilla. So I'm looking for the expression of very particular things in a person to make that like picture match to their like picture to create the healing response. Yeah. It's looking at the whole body and the whole picture and not just one symptom, which is typically what right. the allopathic model does, right? It really just looks at yeah. one, symptom, one treatment because, you know, there isn't a whole lot of different remedies for constipation in allopathic model. So, um, no, there's not. And each of our remedies in um, our Materia Medica, each remedy has a very specific picture. And that's what we, we are continually, even, even though we go through, uh, you know, a four-year program, we're, we're, um, uh, we're constantly learning, we're constantly reading cases, we're constantly uh, working with, with remedies and, and they can go in very uh, deep each person. There's different levels of pathology in each remedy. So you, you start to learn how to identify that too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is definitely something that I know some about, but just, just listening to you today, I'm learning so much more about homeopathy and I'm so happy that other people are going to be hearing this and, um, and learning about it and, you know, using it in their families and getting over the fear of, of what homeopathy is. So, you know, I always think right. if people don't have information, then they replace that with fear. And if you have information then those fears get dispelled and that's a big, big reason I'm trying to do this podcast and, and giving people more access to. Right. To like you. And I agree with that 100% too. We have, um, we have a fear of disease and we have a fear of our body not being able to respond and get well. I, I believe in this, in our culture of Western medicine, um, we need a healthy respect for both, but um, fear can paralyze us and uh, fear can overwhelm us. I see that a lot in my practice. Oh, yeah. Um, I feel, uh, so yeah, it's um, dispelling it, the more you know, the more you can learn, uh, the more you dispel the fear and then you're gaining greater understanding. Yeah. And empowerment. So then you can make those choices, yeah. not in the place of fear. So that is definitely exactly. why, why I'm doing this. So, yeah. And I, and I, I love that you are because it's, it's um, something as parents, we, when we become parents, I remember my biggest fear was, oh my God, what do I do when my kid gets sick for the first time? Oh yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we, um, I think too, we, um, get a lot of fear from, um, sometimes, uh, pressure from other people and what's been deemed normal as for uh, methods of treatment. I know years and years ago, um, you know, for me, uh, taking my kids to a chiropractor, well, what is that? Why would you do that? It still happens today. <laughs> so. <laughs> I, know. I know, but um, but yet chiropractic is people have a better understanding of it now, um, uh, you know, 
it's become more accepted. So people have gotten over their fear. They see that it's, wow, this stuff works. It's not weird. Um, I feel better. Uh, so yeah, home, homeopathy kind of, uh, got a bad rap in the United States in the early, um, 1900s. Um, it, it was very political. The doctors that were using homeopathy here were very, very successful with it, and their mortality rates were very low. There were actually large um, homeopathic hospitals in on the East Coast in New York and Philadelphia. Um, and as the pharmaceutical uh, business started to develop, uh, the doctors using homeopathy were... Um, told if they continued to use this method of treatment that they would lose their licenses. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of, there. sometimes there's politics that get involved in, in what's uh, out there that works too. But um, so it kind of, it kind of went away a little bit and, um, and then um, thank goodness it's had a resurgence again. So it's used yeah. all around the world. I oh, firmly awesome. believe that things like like homeopathy, chiropractic, acupuncture, things that things that work for people are gonna stick around. I mean, people there's some people that seemingly want to try to squash it and get it to go away, but you know, it's the power of of it that just keeps it alive because we don't have right. you know, we're not going out and spending millions and billions of dollars on marketing for homeopathy and chiropractic and you know but it's still around we're still here so something right. must be working so yeah exactly so um how i got started uh with it was um i had some health issues many many years ago and um i tried everything I'd gotten all these tests and this done and that done and saw this person and that person. And um, I finally went to um, a homeopath that was also a naturopath here um, in our area and uh, started with her and started to see a change in my health. And so I brought that into my life. And then um, as I had kids, um, I started using homeopathy for my children. But I do have to confess, at first, I was afraid to use it for my kids, uh, only because I was kind of still under that um, idea that the safest and best way was through allopathic medicine. And then um, one of my children um, had some significant health issues based on some allopathic medicine. And I went back to um, and started learning more about it, um, was mentored from the uh, homeopath that I had started with, seeing for my health, and moved forward, forward um, into eventually studying it. Uh, professionally. Um, so a lot of times, um, going back to that, that fear piece, we're afraid to change. And um, uh, I just know that, um, like a lot of my cases, like I said before, people come to me, uh, if they don't know about homeopathy, um, at the beginning, I'm kind of like the last person. So um, a lot of my cases um, are really in-depth and uh, take um, sometimes three, four months. Sometimes I've worked with clients for a couple of years. And that sounds like a long time to most people because we're used to having instant results. But one thing about homeopathy that I love is it... Um, again, doesn't suppress the healing process. It stimulates the healing process. And our body, uh, in our innate intelligence, um, knows how it needs to heal. And some people heal very fast with the use of homeopathy. And sometimes 
it's a slower process. So that is one thing when I start talking about some of my cases here, I just kind of wanted to bring up for people to understand is um, as a homeopath, once I start working with somebody, um, something that's very different for them that they're not used to with allopathic medicine is communication. In um, my type of uh, practice, it's really important for me to have um, communication with people once they start a remedy. So I'm checking in with them after they've started on a remedy at about week two. Um, and then they do a follow-up with me a month later. And um, I evaluate how the remedy is working with them and I look for specific changes. And then we, we go from there. Sometimes it requires a change in remedy. Sometimes it requires a, a potency change in the remedy and sometimes it requires me to um, change how um, they're using it, meaning how they're, they are dosing with it at home. So that's kind of a, a, a piece too that people uh, need to understand when you're working with a homeopath is you're not just given a remedy and then say, ah, see you later, hope it works. I'm making sure that that remedy is working and your body is responding and we really are starting to see um, changes in whatever it is you came to see me for. Yeah. I mean, it's very important because everyone's path of healing is, is different and with any yeah. natural, you know, healing treatment option that they're getting. So I, uh, yeah, it, I totally align with that. And then hopefully other people understand that as well. I've been under chiropractic care for, you know, 40 years. So I've kind of been in this, model mind frame of healthcare for a while. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so some people it's new to, but it, it's, it, yeah. yeah. So, um, I work with adults and I work with kids. Um, I have lots of interesting cases. Um, is there anything particular maybe you think people would like to hear about or um, I think I think a lot of the people who listen to the podcast have families, have kids, um, and a lot of women listen to the podcast. There's there's men too, but um, so I think like women's health issues, especially when it comes to okay um, hormones and things like that, are pretty hot okay. topics. Just off okay. the top of my head, so. Um, uh, I have a particular case I've been working with um, for the last uh, five months. Um, was uh, came to me for uh, reoccurring yeast infections, um, and it's her menstru menstrual cycle, where she had yeast infections at the end of her menstrual cycle. Um, and that was that was what actually brought her to me. She tried all things, all over the counter medicines, all sorts of medicine from the doctor, uh, that type of thing, and it just wasn't curing up, or you know, it just wasn't it wasn't changing at all. It wasn't getting better. So um, she came to me um, to address that. But as we got into her intake. Um, uh, I saw on that mental emotional level um, a lot of stress for her professionally and a lot of stress for her uh, emotionally within her family, her immediate family with her husband and her kids. So when, when, I, when I take a case, um, I'm looking again at how um, their, their physical presentation is. Um, and again, how their mental um, and emotional cases. So she, um, I can't, I can't go into too great a detail just because of confidentiality. But um, she started on a uh, particular remedy that worked uh, for the first couple of months, and then we had to change that up. And what happened with that is, um, a lot of times the body will respond to a remedy and then you'll start to see new symptoms come out. 
are sometimes old symptoms that they haven't had for a long time or symptoms that hadn't gone away with that first remedy. And so as a homeopath, I have to evaluate that. Um, and she had some new symptoms starting to come out. Um, actually, they were old, but they hadn't bothered her. And so she started having some physical pain that was moving around in her body from from different joints to different joints, from the knees to the elbows to her feet. So that became then um, a part of her body in what we call um, a healing hierarchy. As the body is healing, sometimes it will change and new things will present. So her remedy was again changed. Um, and that remedy was uh, successful in helping her with that. And also, um, interestingly, with digestive issues that she was having with her hormonal issues, and uh, it helped to regulate her period. So her period was coming at a normal 28-day cycle. Um, her digestive issues were getting better. Um, things in the body, um, as far as pain moving around, went away. She was able to... Um, start talking with her husband about some of uh, the things that they needed to be resolving. So it was supporting her on a mental, emotional uh, level as well. Her stress level decreased. She started to enjoy her profession again. She started to be able to deal with um, some of the health issues of one of her um, children that was very significant. And just, you know, wonderfully started this whole response of um, starting to heal and the body to rebalance and for her to start feeling healthy again physically uh, and emotionally to where she started to enjoy going to work. She started to, again, make um, preparations to start getting more support for one of her children that she needed. And it's just that is why I love and I'm so passionate about um, this form of uh, of treatment for people. It can often be very, very life changing and give them their lives back. Yeah, I mean, it's it affects if you affect one part of their health. I mean, you can't not affect so many other things, especially when you're coming at it at a whole body approach, like homeopathy yeah. does, and you know other chiropractic acupuncture and other things as well do that too. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and I tell my clients, um, you know, when one system is not functioning properly, especially for women in your female hormonal system, um, it's affecting all your other systems. Um, and you may not be um, seeing things yet from those symptoms, but eventually um, there is a possibility that you can. So again, it goes to that whole person approach and, and just once it's all kind of back in balance and everything's working as it's supposed to and communicating as it's supposed to, um, you get a state of health again. Yeah. And not only does it affect that one person as a whole, but it affects everybody around them and their families and it like I, I have to um, sometimes get after the moms I take care of and say, you know, you need to take care of yourself, but not just for yourself, which is and should be enough, but also for everybody else that is around you and loves you. Because if you're thriving, then they're going to be able to thrive even more. Yes. So. And I see that um, every time in my practice when I'm working with somebody, whether it's a man or a woman or a child of any age. Um, yeah. The once when you're operating a hundred percent, um, everything else starts to smooth out and, and operate better around you. And the people around you, um, can start getting healthier too. So it's kind of synergi synergetic, synergetic, synergistic. Am I saying that right? <laughs> um, effect to where, where that old, <laughs> That old saying, if mom's happy, every, yep. <laughs> everybody's happy. If mom's healthy, everybody starts to get healthy. And in this particular case with this particular person, 
the child that was having significant issues, um, she did bring that child to me. Uh, he was on is on the autism spectrum and um, nonverbal and regression in speech um, nonverbal um, diagnosis. I don't I, I don't diagnose. They come to me with diagnoses and I just kind of go, okay, I'll put that and I'll write that down, but now I'm going to look at this a different way. Um, so I've been working um, with him and he is uh, making significant progress in um, his behavior. He's able to attend in class. He is able to, um, on a sensory nervous system, um, he is able to not let the noises that happen in a classroom um, affect him on a behavioral level and on a concentration level. He is starting to uh, put together more phrases. He is starting to not want to boss all the other kids around in the class, as well as he's, you know, he's getting healthy on that physical level and that cognitive level and that emotional level. So yeah. that's, that's really um, wonderful to see too. And, and again, I rely on um, a lot of feedback from parents uh, and teachers when I'm working with a child on the autism spectrum. Um, they come in and see me, but I want to know who else around them on a daily basis is seeing changes. And so when I start to hear that the parent comes in and goes, you won't believe the report card they got, and you won't believe what the teacher said, and you won't believe that. And I'm like, yes, 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 yes. Yes. This is why so, we do the things we do. Exactly. Yeah. So um, again, kids, um, present differently no matter what's going on with them, even if they've got the same diagnosis. Like I said, I've worked with a lot of kids on the autism spectrum. Um, I had one young man, uh, he was, he was uh, in his teens um, and uh, was very fearful of the dark um, at home and at school, uh, had difficulty again um, on the sensory levels of um, his hearing his hearing was so sensitive that uh, any auditory disruption to him was just excruciating. He would act out. He would get angry. Um, he would strike out. And if the lights, for some reason, happened to go off in the room, he would he would just panic and, and start to scream. So through um, homeopathic, working with him for about a year, um, he no longer has that fear of the dark. He functions very well in the classroom. He does not get upset if somebody is around him and they're too loud. Um, he's excelling at his music. He participates in uh, a local theater group. Um, he went and got his driver's license and he asked a girl out on a date. Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. That to this me. Is is success. Yeah. Just to see their lives blossom and flourish is yes. so rewarding, right? Yes. And see them get healthy and see them being able to function and um, just uh, the body being able to tolerate the different levels of um, interaction and stimulus, you know, through the nervous system, which you see all the time yeah. in your work. Um, and just how that how that just all integrates and um, and and starts to heal and so that oh. those are those are always um, yeah those are always rewarding yeah so the hormonal piece yeah the hormonal piece for women again um, someone five different people may require five different remedies based on how they present to me. Um, their homeopathy is, is very, um, useful in helping to rebalance hormones. It's very useful, uh, during pregnancy and after postpartum. Um, it's very good for young women who are just starting to menstruate. 
and may not have a, um, you know, a real uh, regular schedule. It uh, helps with mood swings, with the fluctuation of our hormones. It helps with um, uh, excessive bleeding, cramping, pain, things like that. So it's not just, you know, our weepiness or our crabbiness or our or it's also addressing um, any issues where maybe we're uh, having clotting or excessive bleeding or, you know, excessive pain that's just beyond what should be normal um, in a monthly cycle and oh, menopause. I'm so glad that we got uh, a chance to talk about about yeah. homeopathy and all the different things that it definitely can help address. And really it's about helping people's bodies just function the way that they are designed to, you know, yes, out all exactly. that stress in our life. <laughs> so, yeah. So um, like I said, I could go on more, but um, <laughs> yeah, I hope, I hope that gives everybody at least a glimpse into what homeopathy is and, and how it works and, and how it can help. Um, and you I, have a website too that people can reach out to you if they have more questions or want. Some I do. Resources. I do. Mm -hmm, I do have a website, um, and I can. Uh, do you want me to give that to you now? Um, yeah, if you say it now, because not everybody gets on the show notes. Um, I will have it in the show okay. notes with your information, but um, sometimes people just like to jot it down when they're listening too. All right. So um, my. Um, address for that is uh for my website is widby homeopathic.com i'm going to spell that out w-h-i-d-b-e-y-h-o-m-e-o-p-a-t-h-i-c.com awesome and then um you can you can get my um email address from my website and um, I'm always happy to talk to people. Um, they can call me and if they've got questions, you know, just more about what I do. Uh, I'm always happy to talk. Yeah. And do you have, is there, um, is there a website or a resource for links for people in other parts of the country or even the world where yes. people can hook up with them? So, um, again, on my website, I have a resource page, but uh, I'll just go ahead. There's the National Center for Homeopathy. Okay. Yeah. So, if you just put that in Google, National Center for Homeopathy, it's going to take you there. It is a wonderful resource. It tells you all sorts of great stuff, explains homeopathy, um, it can, it, they even have little webinars sometimes for, um, uh, people, you know, w wanting to learn how to use it at home. There's a great book that I recommend to my clients. Um, it's called homeopathic self care, the quick and easy guide for the whole family by Robert Ullman, ND and Judith Reichenberg Ullman, ND. And you can find that on um, Amazon. And I love this book. Uh, I had this book years and years ago. Um, my kids, when they were littler, they'd go grab the book and bring it to me and say, Mom, I don't feel good. So they're learning about <laughs> homeopathy right from the little ones. Yeah. So, uh, And it's got – and the reason I love it, it's so well organized and it's got um, – pictures it's sort of got pictures the way they've laid the whole thing out it's like uh definitely homeopathy home care for beginners oh cool yeah because sometimes sometimes yeah. people need that and i know in some areas of the country and that they can't get access to someone because there isn't someone who actually practices in their community so at least to have some right resources would be great yeah so the other the other thing i can do uh as a homeopath is um i can um work with people over the phone okay. or if they want to Skype. Uh, I started my practice in Virginia and uh, that's where I received all my training. And then we moved back. Um, I, I actually grew up here in the, in, 
uh, this area of Woodby Island on Woodby Island. So when we moved back here, I still had a lot of clients from Virginia. And um, so it's, it's really easy for me to work with people over the phone too, if they're ever interested in that. Oh, good. That's great to know because I know a lot of people who don't have resources that that will be a great, a great thing yeah. for them to be able to do and to have. So, well, thank yeah. you, Carrie, so much for sharing. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, I will make sure I spread this out to people and hopefully if anybody has any questions, they will contact you or um, go to the national center that you um, stated earlier. So right. anything to end with, anything that we didn't talk about that you want to shout out real quick? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, just that homeopathy works. It really, really, truly works and makes a difference in your health. Perfect. And I will have links to yeah. your website and resources on the show notes. If you guys want to check that out um, on the fearless family uh, website. And also we have a Facebook group as well, just called fearless family health. You can ask to join that and then join in on the conversation. So thank you all. Have a great day. And thank you, Carrie. I will talk to you later. You bet. Thank you, Cheryl. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on the fearless family health podcast. Show notes and resources covered in this podcast are available on our website at fearlessfamilyhealth.com. You can also join in on the conversation with other fearless families on our Facebook group, Fearless Family Health. If you like what you hear and want to hear more, please subscribe to upcoming casts and rate us on iTunes. And also don't forget to share it with your friends so we can all be fearless.